Behind this door is the video zone, a place between our world and the video dimension. Waiting to challenge you for control of the video zone is one of the game wizards. Is it Murloc, Scorsia, or Mongo? These two teams will compete for the right to enter the video zone and face that game wizard's challenge. Who will it be? Find out today on... Nick Arcade! Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. Yeah, we are. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. It's that time of night where we get real punchy. Anyway. Yeah, we are. This is episode 141. Right. And uh, we want to give a little shout out at the beginning just oh. to say thank you to Brandon. Yeah. Thanks to Brandon. He's a longtime listener yeah. who loves our podcast or he wouldn't still be listening and uh he sends in episode suggestions uh he sent in one a long time ago to do resident evil 4 which we haven't done yet and he just recently sent in an episode for this one for the nick arcade episode which we were like we're gonna do that one immediately thank you brandon and thank you for your patience while we work on our resident 4 episode which will be coming out soon as well you mean resident evil 4 you said resident 4 Resident 4. That's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a simu- it's a hospital simulator game. You play as the fourth resident? Or you play on the fourth floor as a resident. Anyway, thank you, Brandon. We appreciate the listen, and we appreciate the feedback, and we appreciate the episode suggestions. Always keep sending them in. Anyway, Zach, what have you been uh, recently been playing? Seth, recently I've been playing Sonic Triple Trouble, the 16-bit remake, which is a fan remake of the Sega Game Gear game, Sonic Triple Trouble, which uh, was exclusive to the game gear and this remake is done in the style of a sega genesis game uh well more like a i would actually call it more of like a sega cd game in terms of like some of the effects it's able to do but they do try to keep it as as i think close to what could have been possible on sega hardware but this is not like a rom hack uh this is it's its own standalone game you couldn't play this on real hardware but it's a pretty faithful remake of sonic triple trouble uh it has features that weren't in the original game such as cutscenes and like level transitions and some like uh things that like scripted events that happen in the levels and stuff and updated music updated uh bosses uh, it's pretty good i've been really enjoying it i actually like uh the sonic triple trouble game for the game gear and the prequel to that sonic chaos so it's really fun to see that game kind of fully realized as something a little more than what it was this work is being done by a game developer named noah copeland and he actually released the full free version of sonic triple trouble 16 bit as of of august 2nd 2022 which was uh yesterday as of today's recording so very recently released full version of the game still has some bugs but you know what fan game doesn't have bugs so uh otherwise though it's a very competent fan game and if you're a fan of sonic if you like classic sonic games highly recommend it seth what about you what have you been recently playing i remember from our previous episode you wanted me to play what now i know is bubsy yeah bubsy but i misheard you originally and i thought you said bugsy oh i could not see that bubsy yeah so i looked up the game bugsy and i played a game called bugsy also known as the king of chicago now i did go on and play the retro rewind bubsy as well which we will talk about at the end of the episode during that segment yeah. but i also recently played bugsy it's a text-based adventure game that was released in 1986 and it was released by saint bride's school which also went by the silver sisterhood and they were a cult this uh cult the silver sisterhood released a number of adventure games to raise funds for the cult they were based Based out in Ireland, and they released such adventure games such as Jack the Ripper and Bugsy, the King of Chicago. Now, you would think that you'd be playing in this game, this crime game, perhaps a evil criminal. You, in fact, play Bugsy, a three-foot-tall blue rabbit, and the game takes place in 1922 Chicago, where your objective is to become a very successful crime boss. To become, in fact, the King of Chicago? Like all early text adventure games, uh... Any wrong step 
can lead to a quick death and a reset. Uh, this game actually counts how many minutes you've been playing and then tells you when you die how long you actually survived. And you can go from living to being dead very quickly. In fact, you start off being outside of a bar, you can enter the bar, there are criminals in there who want to shoot you, and you can dodge, and you will stand behind the table and you will do nothing, and then I tried to shoot, and you get shot first, and you die, and you restart. You can not go into the bar, you can go down to the gun store, and I went to the gun store, and I had no money, and I was talking to the gunsmith, there was the option to threaten the gunsmith, so I did that. The gunsmith shot me with their shotgun, and I died. And that's pretty much how Bugsy goes on and plays. So if you like old school text adventure games where you need to type about what the, essentially use a text parser to type out what you want the person to do so y if you like those type of games then yeah check out bugsy it is dated but you can play it for free at archive.org since it was originally released for the zx spectrum nice now today's episode as seth had already mentioned is uh nick arcade which um is kind of an interesting topic uh because typically when we do our episodes we talk about a video game a video game company a rare video game cartridge maybe connected to an event but in this case we're actually covering kind of something different which is a tv show that is video game related um and that is nick arcade now starting off i'll talk about some of my memories of nick arcade sure i don't have a lot because it was a very very early television show for my life. Uh, I think it well, it started in 92, right? So I wasn't born when it started airing and it stopped in what, 97? Yep. So I was I was four. So ultimately, I don't remember Nick Arcade in my formative years. Did I watch Nick Arcade? Maybe. I might have been in the same room when Seth watched Nick Arcade. But those memories are long since ob obliterated. <laughs> they were replaced by other things at this point because that was like over 20 years ago. So Seth, however, has, has better memory genes than I do. So I think he might have some memories. I love this show. I think Nick Arcade is great. I also think it's funny because it's called Nickelodeon Arcade or Nick Arcade on the Nickelodeon channel so it's really just arcade is the name of the show which is which is great so this show I would say is close to perfection for me because I was and still am a fan of physical game shows such as like Double Dare Legends of the Hidden Temple and Guts where you have to go through various different obstacle courses or do like physical challenges where you have to test your metal against the other children or families I guess if you're playing Double Dare and I I love those game shows and I also really enjoyed video games and still enjoy video games. So Nick Arcade combined a physical game show with video games. And there is nothing better than that. I still have memories of it uh, bopping around in my old brain of them being in the game because at the in the final challenge which we'll talk about the different sections of the show um but in the final challenge of the show you are transported to be part of the video game and you have to like go through and like touch random things that don't exist in the real world but exist in the video game screen and you have to fight wizards at the end it's great one of the wizards looks like gandalf and he throws lightning balls and it's nothing better in life than fighting an old man throwing lightning balls at you so nick arcade is it was a weekend show and it was it was just perfect you watch some like legends of the hidden temple some Double Dare and uh, some Nick Arcade. Yeah. To get into the history, Nickelodeon Arcade or Nick Arcade, or as Seth correctly pointed out, Arcade, was the brainchild of James Bethia and Kara Mitev. It would go on to be hosted by Phil Moore and announced by Andrea Lively. And it ran for two seasons, which would include 84 episodes. They also had a few pilots of the episode, including an unaired pilot, but those don't necessarily count for the total run. No, yeah. It originally aired from January of 1992 and continued to air reruns of the show up through September of 1997. And the show was held on a weekend afternoon late enough to air after the uh, Saturday morning cartoons. And I feel like they killed it in September because all those kids were going back to school. Oh, I'm sure they did. I felt like September, September was like the death of anything that you were used to in summer. Stick Stickly was gone. Face Guy was gone. It was just... Uh, it was so disappointing. Yeah. It was like when Nickelodeon's like, ah, we're just going to re-air the same episode of Rugrats four times in a row. They won't know. Anyway, the game show itself was split up into multiple sections. The face-off, the main rounds involving Mikey's world, and uh, the final section, which was the video zone. The game show was a head-to-head -head style show 
show, where two teams of two went against each other in two rounds. The video zone was technically a bonus round, only one team would go through. And the first section, Face Off, was the way the show would determine who would go first in each round. The Face Off section was always very short, about 30 seconds, not including the banter that you would have between the contestants and the hosts, but they played video games that were designed only for Nick Arcade, though many of these were just iterations of versions of the same game. Uh, the three base games were Meteoroids, Brainstorm, and Post Haste. Each of the games was played by both contestants at the same time. Meteoroids was a first-person space shooter where each contestant was required to move crosshairs to shoot at objects in the space, which were primarily space objects, such as asteroids and other ships. The contestant that shot the most objects won the face-off. They would go on to reskid the game so that it took place in somebody's body, and they called it Laser Surgeon, and instead of shooting space objects, you shot body things, like bad cells, I guess because why would you be shooting good cells? Another game was Brainstorm, and each contestant was tasked with defending a side of the screen which represented neurons. And there was a ball of electricity that represented impulses, and it bounced back and forth, and the contestants would control a sort of paddle. If this game sounds like Pong, you would be correct. It was essentially just Pong, but it was sped up so that it was tense and you could play a significant amount of it within 30 seconds. And whoever protected the most neurons would go on to win. They reskinned this game not once, but twice. They reskinned it so that instead of neurons, there were speakers. And it, instead of a ball of electricity, it was a sound wave. And they called it Battle of the Bands. And you had to protect Ooh. the speakers. They also then reskinned it again, where they turned the speakers into like metal sections of a spaceship. And the okay. ball was a comet. And they called it Star Defenders. Finally, the game Post Haste was a side-scrolling racing game that was actually played split screen so okay the all the previous games were played on one screen this game was played on one screen but with a split screen where each of the contestant would control a mailman while there were various obstacles that had to be avoided kind of like paperboy whoever got their mailman the farthest would win. This game would also go on to get reskins twice. However, if you're looking to watch Post Haste in action, it's only in season two of Nick Arcade and all of the reskins, obviously. So if you want some Post Haste action, you gotta wait till season two. The first reskin changed the mailmen to jet skis and the contestants had to avoid obstacles on a river and they called it jet jocks. I wish they were mailmen riding jet skis because that would be great. Like you had to deliver mail while riding a jet ski. That would be great. That'd be fun. Then they reskinned it again and instead of jet skis, they were ATVs. And now I know you're thinking in your head what an ATV looks like. No, no, it was not that. What it looked like was a moon lander and you got to drive on the moon and you had to avoid moon obstacles. And that game was called Crater Rangers. Now, since the teams were always two people, one member of the team would do the face-off section for the first round and the second member would do the face-off section for the second round. Whoever won face-off scored some points for the team, either 25 or 50 points, depending on whether it was the first or second round. Generally, the way Nick Arcade worked, the points got bigger in the second round. And they would go first and gain control of Mikey. Who is like the uh, Avatar? Yeah, 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 yeah. the Matt the mascot avatar of the contestants. If there was a tie, whoever could answer a trivia question right would get the point and the control of Mikey. Interestingly enough, Nick Arcade uses trivia to solve a lot of ties. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. The main game consisted of a large game board that was projected up on a television and it was divided among 18 squares. It also had a theme and there were 11 themes that Mikey could explore and they ranged from a pirate's cove to just a neighborhood. <laughs> it's just exciting like yeah go from being a pirate's cove or i could even see him on the moon or just he you does know, go to the moon yeah you're just you know the neighborhood mikey has a both riveting and a very mundane life it sounds like <laughs> and of course the enemies he'd encounter were themed according to the theme of the level so i imagine at the mall he was encountering what like just other people <laughs> no game over was there oh and we'll talk about game over when we get to the enemies the players controlled mikey who again is the avatar and was a brown haired dude 
dude, usually dressed in like blue shorts and a light blue t-shirt with a lightning bolt across the t-shirt. Mikey would be able to be moved in one space in four directions, up, down, left, or right. The objective was to get Mikey to the goal space, which was visible. However, the squares in between would have various different surprises. Now, even though getting to the goal space was the main objective, the true winner of Nick Arcade would be the team that collected the most points. In Nick Arcade's case, it was worthwhile to encounter the non-goal squares to end up earning points. You'd really want to get as many points as you could before you made your dash to the goal, essentially. Right. I, I mean, that dash was one space at a time, so it wasn't really a dash. There were eight iterations of squares that Mikey could land on. There were the four Ps, points, puzzles, pop quizzes, and prizes. Now, as you do this, you're going to run into our four Ps, points, puzzles, pop quizzes, and prizes. There are also uh, video challenges, enemies, time bombs, and of course, the goal. Now, we are going to mention points that the team could earn on the different squares. Just know that these points would be doubled for the second round of the game, just like Face Off was. Yeah, and generally it was 25 points. With the point square, if Mikey landed on a point square, the team was awarded 25 points, and they were allowed to continue to move Mikey pretty good deal (laughs) yeah uh, uh, arguably the best (laughs) if they landed on the video puzzle square a different from the video challenge square which we'll talk about in a bit the visual puzzle square was was just that it was a puzzle that was done through a video one puzzle for example was you would see something break but it'd be rewound and you had to guess what it was another example would be they would you'd be shown a short video clip and when it was over they would ask you questions about the video clip to make sure you were paying attention and whichever team was right would get the points and ultimately control of Mikey. Successful video puzzles would award 25 points and again the control over Mikey. If you landed on the pop quiz square, a surprise, a trivia question was asked to the teams that related to the theme of the overall game board. Whoever buzzed in quickest with the correct answer got the 25 points and control over Mikey. Now there was also a prize square and this square just gave the team who landed on it a prize and that prize was theirs regardless if they won the show or not. These prizes were, of course, era appropriate. And I would say like they would generally be like video game cartridges, maybe some sneakers from British Night, or maybe some candies. Imagine you land on a prize and you get like some awesome video game and then someone else lands and they get a freaking candy bar. (laughs) (laughs) It might have happened. I don't think prize squares were incredibly super landed on all the time uh, yeah and there were better like prizes it. for winning the actual there was consolation prizes and also prizes for winning the actual show there was also enemy squares so this square would have an animated enemy attack mikey this would really just you would lose control of mikey and it would pass to the opposing team each of the enemies were themed to the game board however some of the enemies would cross multiple themes such as the main i would say the main villain of the game Beyond the wizards, I think the, I feel like the wizards were the main enemies of the contestants. The main enemy of Mikey would be Game Over, who was the town bully. He would yell, hold it right there, Bean Brain. And then he would throw a cream pie into the screen. Hold it right there, Bean Brain! This enemy was a uh, reoccurring enemy who would appear in a few other game boards, such as you would encounter Game Over at the mall, or he would be on the beach in the specific ocean board. And yes, it is the specific ocean. I like that it's called the specific ocean. But he would only be encountered on the beach, so if you're in the in the water, you might run into the hammerhead enemy, who would, he would hammer Mikey with his head. There was also a Wild West theme game board where you could run into Silly the Kid who was hidden on the Slurpee Gulch game board and was a satire of Billy the Kid. (laughs) I don't like Slurpee Gulch, jeez. He was a satire of Billy the Kid, except he was a baby and wielded baby bottles as pistols. And he would say, dance, ba- partner, and spray baby bottles at the screen. There was also a jungle theme where you would fight a witch doctor who would blow Mikey up like a balloon and pop him. Show's weird. <laughs> the witch doctor, Silly the Kid, and Game Over would take their attacks and like face the screen. So like Game Over would throw a pie at the screen. All of the other enemies, there's a genie, a ghost, uh, the hammerhead shark. They would all attack Mikey 
in the like as like a cartoon. There was also the time bomb square. This square was a fun square because it was the square that would become the square after Mikey had gone to the square and had left the square. If a contestant wanted to go backwards onto a square, they would have to go through the time bomb. And if they landed on the time bomb, they would get 10 seconds to spell word, but only one letter at a time between the two teammates. If they were successful at doing the ping pong spelling, they would be able to successfully keep control over Mikey. However, if they were unsuccessful, they lost control. This happened very infrequently. Not losing the control. Going to the time bomb square happened very infrequently. Phil Moore, the host, would actually actively try and stop people from moving Mikey in the wrong direction. In fact, to where sometimes he would just tell them he couldn't move in that direction or advise against them, saying that's not the way to the goal. Because the thing is, you saw the game board and you saw the goal. You literally knew which path that Mikey could travel in. So uh, to be fair, like if somebody landed on the time bomb square and lost control of Mikey, it's not surprising. Now, there was the goal square, of course. Whichever team moved Mikey into the goal, they were then asked a question which came from a category the opposing team selected. If they got the correct answer, they would earn 50 points and the goal. If they were incorrect, the opposing team would take 25 points and the goal. However, frequently, the time would just run up without either team getting Mikey to the goal. So then they were just asked a pop quiz question, and whoever got it right got the 50 points, and they moved on to the next round. <laughs> Arguably one of the coolest parts of the show, Nick Arcade. One of. We'll talk about the coolest part soon. But one of the coolest parts of Nick Arcade was the video challenge square. When you landed on the video challenge square, you would be able to go to one of the five arcade cabinets set up in the studio with lit up marquees. They were home consoles within the arcade cabinets, and Nick Arcade would use uh, either a Nintendo Entertainment System, the Super Nintendo, a Sega Genesis, a Turbo Graphics, and even a Neo Geo at one point. One of the team members would select one of the five displayed games, and they would need to beat a set of challenges, perhaps getting a certain score or collecting a certain item within a certain time limit, and they would have 30 seconds to do this. The other team member got to bet secretly using a Magna Doodle. They would bet how much they wanted to risk. They could risk zero all the way to their current score. It's like Jeopardy. You can, you know. Right. It was, it was in fact, exactly like Jeopardy. <laughs> they could also always bet like 25 or so, the value of the question for that round. If their teammate accomplished the task, they would add the bet value to the score, or they would have it subtracted. The marquee light would get turned off for that game since each game could only be played once per show. They would also have information regarding the game, such as the name and the publisher, appear at the bottom of the screen. In fact, all the cabinets had two consoles running at the same time. One of the consoles just had the game running in a tracked mode, where the game would be essentially showing off of the demo continuously. Even when the game was played and the light was turned off, it still ran in a tracked mode, so they didn't turn off the arcade, they just turned off the light. The other console that was in the cabinet was actually paused at the moment in time that the game show producers wanted the contestants to play at. So they would just, off camera, switch the monitor inputs, and then when they cut to them standing in front of the arcade cabinet, they were ready to go. Clever. So in the background of, yeah, pretty like old, old tech clever, right? Yeah. Uh, just use the old switcheroo. But yeah, so in the background of the game, there was always these five arcade cabinets playing the demo mode of all the, the games currently that are out there. And and they would just switch it around and then they'd get ready to play. I was uh, watching an episode recently where they uh, would go and play Joe and Mac. And I was talking to Zach because at some point in time when they moved from the original run to the reruns, it was done by the Nickelodeon gas service. And the gas service logo always sat in the bottom left hand of the screen, which is where the video game name and publisher of the video game sat so like joe and mac was published by data east and the, so the nickelodeon gas logo sat above that so you couldn't actually read what the game was because the logo was in the way which i thought was just ironic and funny because i would be less than pleased if i was data east and no one could read that it was joe and mac i mean it's joe and mac so like people should be able to identify it though they did have an interesting spread of games and out of all of the game consoles that they used nick Arc 
arcade, loved the Sega Genesis out of all of them. Out of the 48 video games that they would show off in the 84 episodes, Nick Arcade would have 19 of those. 48 would be Sega Genesis games. 11 would be SNES games. Seven of eight of them would be Neo Geo games. Seven of them would be the NES games, and three of them would be the Turbo Graphics 16. Some of the games were not just for the Sega Genesis, but they always had like they would generally use the Sega Genesis version. They were sometimes multi-platform release. I think uh, Turrican was on there at once at one point as the Sega version. There was also like R Type was on as a game to play. So it may have been that they just had a, an abundance of Sega Genesis consoles. Remember that they did need two of them, so they needed. 10 consoles in total, and these are when the consoles were not necessarily cheap. Now, I understand that they're a television budget, but still, that you're looking at maybe three to 400 bucks per console, and you need 10, so you're looking at $4,000 right there. But I can imagine the fact that, not knowing exactly the details of why they use so many Sega games, but I wouldn't be surprised if Sega, being the company that it was, might have offered them maybe a little extra. Sure. To, uh promote more sega oriented titles it would make sense with one of the titles that we will talk about as appearing on on nick arcade coming up i don't want to spoil it but we've alluded to it before but for them to get like early releases and prototypes it seems like they had to have some type of connection that might have been separate from maybe a connection with nintendo or snk and there was a couple qualifiers that they needed to have in order for them to have the game the game itself needed to have an attract mode so if the game didn't have an attract mode which a majority of the console games during this time did have some sort of a demo mode that kicked in but if it didn't have one they couldn't use it and it had to generally have some sort of scoring system so that they could easily make a, a challenge, right? They could say, you need to get 900 points before 30 seconds is up. So they did have to reach in regards to creating these hurdles. They could just put a score number and say 30 seconds. So that generally led to a, a certain type of games. Like you weren't going to see like like a role-playing game, like <laughs> like Shining Force 2 as one of the games that they played. God, I wish. But you, you'd see a lot of shoot-em-ups and stuff. Another fun fact with the video challenges is that on some Nick Arcade, they would have celebrity guest episodes. So, for example, they had a episode where the cast of Sweet Your Shorts came on, and they had one where Clarissa Explains It All's cast came on. Now, for those who are unaware, a celebrity that you may be aware of, Melissa Joan Hart, was on Clarissa Explains It All. She was, in fact, Clarissa. She would end up playing the prototype of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on Nick Arcade, and it was an earlier version of the game, even before Sonic 2 beta and was different than the final released version and fortunately we have zach here who's right. a sonic specialist sonic historian so the sonic 2 version shown during nick arcade is actually the earliest known prototype of sonic 2 uh it is colloquially known by sonic preservationists and sonic fans as the nick arcade prototype for obvious reasons while some of the elements seem very similar to the sonic 2 beta that seth and i have talked about before um, which was discovered by simon y on a bootleg cartridge the nick arcade prototype was actually a lot of content from sonic 1 that was still remaining in the code because sonic 2 was built on sonic 1 notably the level select shows all of sonic 1 level names and you can access an incredibly buggy version of sonic 1's green hill zone um it's buggy in the sense that all the collision is wrong so sonic will like walk and then just drop off the screen and die a lot of the music in the game is actually just from sonic 1 which you can actually hear when melissa joan hart plays the game so she plays in emerald hill zone which is of course a sonic 2 level but the music playing is clearly starlight zone from the first sonic game a copy of the cartridge was purchased by a preservationist named drx for around 1500 dollars and was preserved via a rom dump so the prototype is available the cartridge is actually really cool looking it's just a standard sega cartridge but it has a sonic and tails label that was apparently holographic it's hard to get a photo of it because holographic doesn't really show up in, in photos but it has kind of a shimmer to it in in the photos that you see they wouldn't need to have two too yeah so there is another one floating out there somewhere
somewhere. Whether or not DRX has that one or it, it might be just somewhere in a collection or preserved by or like held on by someone or it could have been destroyed. <laughs> but who knows? Uh, we do know that one cartridge at least is dumped and preserved. It is really interesting though. It's it's the Emerald Hill Zone looks mostly complete. Melissa Joan Hart doesn't get very far in it. She gets caught up on a loop-de-loop because she wouldn't know how to do a spin dash because Sonic 1 didn't have spin dashes. So she doesn't know that you can do the spin dash to get up the loop. But the Sonic 2 prototype that she was playing has the spin dash implemented. It also has a weird thing where if Sonic moves too fast and hits a solid wall, he would like fall backwards like he got injured. He wouldn't take any damage, but he would just be like knocked back and it would like throw you off. There's also a cut enemy featured in the level, which you see when Melissa Joan Hart is playing. It's a snail. And apparently the fourth buzz bomber in Emerald Hill Zone is the last one that can actually hit you where all of the buzz bombers following that fourth one, they like very rarely can do damage. It's apparently they're just busted in terms of AI. They won't shoot at you and stuff. So that's kind of interesting. There's just little, these little differences that you'll see. And you can see them when you're watching that one clip. Sonic 2 aside, back to Nick Arcade and the way these games would work. Whichever team had the most points at the end of the two rounds would go on to the video zone. After these two rounds are up, after they've gone through all these different squares, after all the points are added up, you would go to the video zone. If there was a tie, which could happen, the winner of the tie, uh, which would be someone who answers a tie-breaking question, would be awarded 100 points, and that would be whoever would be the victor in this scenario. Now, the video zone was the final section of the game show and was arguably the best section of the game show. It would only last a minute. The actual video game zone section would last a minute. There was a lot of banter in between. The show ran for about 24 minutes and the video zone section from start to finish, meaning from them saying this is the video zone section and the credits rolling was about four to five minutes. The rest of the show was dedicated to driving Mikey around a map. Now, the video zone was where they would put physical challenges in front of the contestants and they would have to accomplish this in front of a blue screen. In fact, Nick Arcade was one of the first American television shows to do this integration of animation combined with live action Mm -hmm. using a blue screen. They would layer in video game effects into the blue screen and the contestants would have to actually watch a screen to see where the generated special effects would show. And the video zone challenge was broken up into three different levels and the clock was set for 60 seconds. The contestants would then have to obtain three objects per each level and they were given five units of power and they would use lose a unit of power if they encountered a hazard or an enemy character. If they ran out of power they would have to reset the stage and they would have to go for the objectives again until either the time ran out or they were successful. Power-ups would spawn as well, which would grant powers to the players, such as killing all the enemies on the screen or restoring the power bar to full. There were five level ones that you could see throughout the series of the show. Three of those level ones appeared in season one, and two they added two more additional ones that appear in season two. Then there were eight different level twos where five appear in season one and three are added in into season two. So there would be some combination of these level ones and then level twos. There was also within the power-ups there was I think money that you could grab as well so you could get like 50 bucks or something like that. That was virtual money. That became real money when you won. An example of the levels would be like Jungle Fever where the contestants would have to climb trees and try to obtain three bunches of bananas all while avoiding the hazards of the jungle like monkeys tossing coconuts or flying toucan sams. Another example would be the food fight where it took place in a school lunchroom and there was a food fight in progress. The contestants had to collect three textbooks scattered about, all while avoiding food and the gym coach. There was a power-up in this level that was a stinky gym shoe that would stop the food fight. Finally, there was the wizard, who they would have to fight, and there were three that it could be. Murloc, Scorchia, and Mongo. Murloc was essentially evil Gandalf slash Dumbledore, and he tossed lightning balls. Scorchia was like Firestar, who was a sorceress and tossed fireballs and mongo was a troll who wore armor and you guessed it he tossed energy balls the contestants had to dodge literal balls and and collect other floating balls and if they did so they would win 
Nick Arcade. And what would they win? Prize packages. Usually included a trip to U.S. Space Camp or a trip back to Universal Studios. They could also win bicycles or even video game or computer systems. Like the original Macintosh. There were a few times that it was a big trip package to like uh, Jamaica or something that was offered. I'm sure they did like uh, cruise line packages. I remember those were a popular prize on Guts. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did a cruise line package. Unless Guts got more budget. D- Guts definitely got more budget. The minor prizes or consolation prize were usually sneakers. Specifically the brand British Knight sneakers. Candy or a video game cartridge. So once again, let me remind you that someone could win a trip to Jamaica and another person could win candy. <laughs> As a consolation prize maybe if they, they would have won the trip to Jamaica if they tried harder. Yeah, but I want to compare consolation prizes real quick. So Nintendo World Championship had a consolation prize where you won like like money in a, in a savings bond, but it's still money. Well, because it's an experience, right? right. You're at Universal Studios and you're like, do you want to be on television? And you're like, sure. And they're like, we're filming Nick Arcade today and we When you leave after the whatever 40 minutes that you're here, we're going to film another episode of Nick Arcade. Yeah, that's like the one thing I always kind of forget about these game shows is that these game shows were experiences. It was kind of like going to like Disney World and going to see a show. Right. It was literally like going to see a show. You would be at Nickelodeon Studios located at Universal Studios Orlando, which was a fully operating studio where they filmed things. So you you would probably be on vac- summer vacation. And what did you do for summer vacation? You got to be on national television. <laughs> So the original set was done as Get the Picture set was where the original, like the pilot was filmed. And originally the pilot had the teams where colors were red and blue. However, blue had to get changed to the yellow team because if blue made it to the video zone, their bodies would disappear because of the blue screen. And they iterated on the original pilot. Like they originally had them in like TV cabinets instead of arcade style cabinets and so on and so forth. So I want to find a couple of the pilot episodes because i think it would be kind of unique they had different host and announcer set up as well but i i did learn something with um so like nick arcade you had like one set right so you couldn't really film multiple episodes at once legends of the hidden temple filmed three at once at all all time yeah they had multiple sets yeah kirk fogg was a busy man he was he would just go from one episode to the next episode you know that explains why he always looks incredibly exhausted yeah and wearing the same clothes <laughs> This is the same sweaty, sweaty shirt. Anyway, let's get into the legacy for a bit. Seth, tell me about Nick Arcade today. Surely it's still going on, this blast from the past. Well, obviously it stopped running in 1997. You can watch episodes on Nick Arcade legally on Paramount Plus or Amazon where you can buy it. However, in 2015, James Bethia and Karen Metiv got out of retirement or whatever they were doing. And they actually got Phil Moore to join with them. And they decided they wanted to relaunch Nick Arcade. Hell yeah. And they were going to call it the nth level because that's what they were going to bring to the table. They were going to bring Nick Arcade, upgrade it to the nth level. And Phil Moore was going to host, and they were going to upgrade the technology using the first iteration to modern standard. Nice. I'm so excited. They went on Kickstarter, and they asked for a paltry $350,000. I'm sure they blew that out of the water. They received $3,000. Oh, no. $53. Oh, no. (laughs) With 52 backers. Oh, no. They had a website, nthlevel.com, which is no longer available. And uh, that's it. That's where Nick Arcade is today. Nobody's interested in moving it along. So um, that is our Nick Arcade episode. Thank you again, Brandon, for suggesting this. This is a great topic. Uh, But let's get into the Retro Rewind section. Seth gave me Math Rescue. Math Rescue is a game. It's a math game. You you solve math problems. It was developed in 1992 by Redwood Games and published by Apogee. I played the shareware copy, but a version is available to be purchased to this day on Steam for $4.99. I figured I'd go the old school route and I played 
played a shareware copy before I decided to purchase the game fully. It's okay. It reminds me a lot of Commander Keen, but instead of killing aliens, you are solving basic arithmetic. I don't know how else to talk about this game. I mean, yeah, there's the giant nose thing that Seth talked yeah. about, but the game is mostly just like platforming around. Sometimes you'll encounter enemies and you click a button and you just like dump slime on the enemy and it stops attacking you. And then you like hit like a Mario block and then you have to solve a math problem. And it's basic arithmetic. There's different options. You can do addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, or a combination of all of them. I am not good at math, let me tell you. So I did addition and subtraction because I was like, I'm going to have the best time doing something that I can solve pretty quickly versus something I have to actually think about. And um, I'm not a big math person, so I thought it was kind of boring, but is an odd game, that's for sure. Uh, in any case, does it hold up? It's a math game from 92. Not really. I personally prefer Super Solvers. I think Super Solvers holds up as a math game. That's the one with the twirling? Yeah, yeah, where you have like the remote control. And you the zap zapper? Thing. Yeah, the zapper. Yeah. That holds up. Uh, this one, not so much. If it's a game that you're nostalgic for, it probably will hold up. But I didn't play Math Rescue as a kid. I didn't even play it in school. So it does not hold up for me. Seth, next week I have a kind of a cool game for you. And I promise it's a it's a pretty good game. I actually really like this game. Uh, this game is called Zook Hero Z. Zook spelled Z-O-O-K, Hero Z. But I have a challenge for you, Seth. I don't want you to look up anything about this game before you play it. I want you to go into a blind. And you know what? I'm going to go into blind the game that you suggested for me. I just think Zook Hero Z is a very, I like it. I think it's a really good game, but I think it's best to experience it blind for someone who uh, might not know what to expect. I mean, I, I don't necessarily know if you need to go in blind in my game that I'm going to recommend to you. I might not need to go in blind because I might have already played it. Anyway, not only did I play Bugsy, I played Bubsy for the Sega Genesis, which was released in 1993 for both the SNES and the Sega Genesis. I played the Genesis version. It was developed and published by Accolade, and you play as a what I imagine is a flying squirrel yeah. named Bubsy, who wears a t-shirt and not much else. Uh, you have to run through the level quickish, and you can jump on enemies, and you gain some momentum when you jump on it. Not as much momentum as I would like. It's like if Sonic and Mario decided to combine their game poorly, and it's also like Sonic, where you run real fast, but unlike Sonic, you die unpredictably, and it feels like you're kind of always running on banana peels. Uh -huh. The character is very, very loose. I actually had issues with the controls being really loose and kind of had difficulty getting up to like the momentum in like the movement that I would normally in Sonic because Sonic has tight controls. Like Sega Genesis Sonic games have tight controls. There is also crates of bananas that are available. So then you are, you have banana peel like controls on banana peels. So then you're not going anywhere fast. It's kind of rough. Also, yeah, I, there would be times where Bubsy would just die from fall damage and there was sometimes where he just didn't die from fall damage the enemies in the game do remind me of the noid from dominoes and i didn't really think about that creature in a really long time so there's that uh when i was playing the game i'm like wow all these guys look like the noid in fact if you told me they were the noid and bubsy was wearing a t-shirt with a d on it instead of an exclamation point i would believe you if you told me that dominoes made this game <laughs> overall it's an all right mascot platformer there are definitely better similar games Games out there uh, that were released in the same time. Uh, I had Tiny Toon Adventures vibes going on the entire time, and that game is better than Bubsy. Does it hold up? Uh, it does versus previous retro rewinds that Zach has graced me with. Yeah, I think the original Bubsy is not bad. Yeah, it's not. It's not bad. There is a cool ability where you can kind of float with Bubsy, and so if you enjoy a mascot platformer, I would recommend checking it out. Now for Next week, Zach, what I want you to play, and you can play it blind or not, if it's fine, is EcoQuest, The Search for Cetus. Nice. That's fun. I look forward to playing EcoQuest. Well, that's going to be our Nick Arcade episode. Thank you again, Brandon, for sending in the, the request. Look forward to future weeks for your other request. And thank you, everyone else, for listening to this episode. It is one of our, I would say, our first episode that's more adjacent to our topic than most. So if you like this episode and like us covering this type of thing, I'm sure we can cover other video game adjacent type topics as well. Uh, we're more than happy to do that. So please 
please feel free to write in and recommend us some things. If you are looking to hear us more, we're available where all podcast apps are available. You can contact us by sending us an email at classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com. And you can follow us on our social medias. Our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitch are all Classic Gaming Brothers. And our Twitter is CG Brothers Pod. And that's going to be it. Unless Zach's got anything else for me. Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Zach. And I've been Seth. We've been the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. right.